Awesome. Hey, everybody. This is Ether Force. I'm here live with Thomas Joseph Brown, the one and only. <laughs> Tom, what's up, brother? Hey, it's good day. Good to talk with you, Tech. Hey, Lovely coming, to be here. Coming uh, to us from Auckland, right? New Zealand. Auckland, New Zealand. Sunny um, spring day here. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us, brother. So, disappearing yeah. stars. So, when you get to a certain altitude, you can't see the stars. I, I remember being in a plane. Every single plane I've been on my life, that was at night. I looked up and I could never see stars. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I believe I've seen pro potentially like Venus or Jupiter. I think I've seen some um, like that. But um, why don't we start out and show folks, because people go, wait a minute, you can't see the stars. What are you talking about? Uh, we have a picture here, I believe, of the stars taken from the uh, International Space Station. Um, Is this it? Yeah. This is a pretty awesome that, picture. Right, that, that's a time lapse of um, Don Petit, I believe is his name, the uh, man on this space station who's been taking pictures such as this. So obviously, pictures have been taken of stars in space and people have seen them. However, <laughs> that, that's not the whole story, as we're about to find out here. And we were hoping to play some videos, but we discovered uh, some uh, serious limits here on this Hangout technology. Um, so we'll put some links for these. But these are sort of classic things. Is one of the ones we're going to play is, is uh, um, at this press conference um, when the Apollo 11 crew came back from their alleged trip to the moon, and uh, the British astronomer Patrick Moore asks them, well, could you see the stars in space? And, you know, three of them are looking at each other all confused, like they forgot what to say. Go, yeah, I think so. And go, no, nah, I didn't go. I didn't see him. Go, yeah, well, maybe through the optics we did. And it's like, yeah, they're like, they got caught, right? <laughs> well, can you see him? Can't you see him? Um, and well, I think good thing to put in here is like when Neil Armstrong, you know, 25 years later, you know, when he was at the um, White House, and he's given a speech and he says, you know, today we have with us a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Now, what do you tell a bunch of school kids that on the 25th anniversary of the moon for? This is a guy I couldn't remember if he saw stars when he was in space. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> It's absolutely amazing. I mean, the fact that he would speak like that, he was definitely trying to get a, get a message across to us, right? Oh, exactly. And that's why I thought, well, I should basically tell the story of how I got involved in this then. Uh, because that's really where a lot of this comes from, from my aspect. So I would say back in, it was probably about 1987 when I was uh, reading through the book Man or Matter. And I got quite interested in atmospheric color formation as per Goethe's theory of color, where light's just not, um, you know, the Corellian scattering. But it's actually darkness coming through a lighted sort of medium. And there's an experiment, which I've never performed, um, but I actually understand it, and I've, I've seen it in certain effects. And that is, is let's, we actually need a jug of water, something to stir into it that makes it opaque gradually as you stir it in and stays in suspension, and a light bulb, like a basic you know, tungsten filament light, and a black card. So basically, the experiment is... You put the light bulb behind the jar of water. You start stirring in the medium, and it goes from yellow to red as it gets thicker, which is like the sun going down the atmosphere. Um, but then for the blue side, basically you put the black card behind, and you shine the light from the side, and basically see black. And as you start making the medium, the uh, liquid medium more opaque, it starts going blue and goes towards violet. So I was thinking, well, this would be an interesting experiment. Um, I'd like to reproduce it authentically. So 
I called up NASA and I th uh, said, um, yeah, I'm a researcher in um, atmospheric optics and I was actually hoping to find out what the dominant spectra of the sun is in the optical wavelengths above the atmosphere. And uh, they're going, uh, now we don't have that information. I'm going, yeah, come on, man. It's like you've been up there for a long time. Um, it was like about 25 years at that time. And I'm saying, you know, you know, Skylab, you had all that equipment up there. You, you don't, you, you go, no, no, we don't, just don't have that information. I said, well, how about um, just a white light photo of the sun in space? I can just use it as like a experimental reference, so at least you know, got some authenticity to the experiment. I go, no, nope, we don't have any of those either. I go, how about pictures of stars? White light pictures of stars? Nope, we don't have any. And I was rather puzzled by this. Although I had heard, um, I, cause I remember I came across in one of Wilhelm Reich's writings, and I haven't been able to retrace that reference. But he spoke about how stars would, space would probably be black, and that stellar light would be what he called orgone illumination of the atmosphere. And also, um, Dinsha Gadiali, the great uh, color healer who developed the spectrochrome system, he, he also said that space would be black and that the stars would appear on the atmosphere. So, so this comes out of sort of like old occult sort of tradition. Um, so I started thinking, well, well, maybe there's something to all this. Um, so I thought, well, this is a rather curious sort of affair. So NASA did actually send me a lot of stuff, and I did, like, here's sort of like old um, envelopes from NASA that they, the guy started sending me these various pictures, and I believe that we have a picture here, which I could uh, perhaps put up. Um, they sent me a number of... Um, of what? Of photos. It's one that's called S73-3378 scan. Uh, yes, I see it. Yeah. Um, let's see. That? Can you get that one up, or do you want me? I've got it up right now. Oh, there, yep, there it is. Um, okay, now what we see here on this picture is is that this is basically, uh, you know, from the back of the photo, this solar eruption of uh, is that the one? Yeah, solar eruption of June 10th, 1973, seen as the spectral heliogram obtained during the first manned Skylab mission, Skylab 2. The SO82A experiment, an Apollo telescope mount component covering the wavelength region from 150 to 650 angstroms. That's the extreme uh, ultraviolet. Solid disk to center was produced from 304 angstrom ultraviolet light from helium plus ions. Um, so what we're looking at here is, this is a spectral heliogram, but it's only showing the, um, you know, the visible disk at one wavelength, which is sort of like ionized helium. Um, so that's actually rather curious. If we can, um, let me see if I can show this here. Do you see my screen here? It's quite a bit of stuff um, on it. Yeah. I see yours. So I put mine up here. I'm not sure which one of us is controlling this, but here, uh, here's just a basic spectral heliogram of the sun and the optical wavelengths from Earth. Right? You see all these little lines, these dark lines. Well, where those dark lines are at, that's what images the sun in outer space. So when you go and you look at all these pictures of the sun taken from space, they're usually in the ex extreme ultraviolet, but you can get like hydrogen alpha, so they actually, where you get a black line here, the absorption lines, that's what they're imaging the sun in, and that's what we can see on that other picture, is, is that, um, let's go back to this other picture again here. No, it's not. Yes, typical hangout stuff. We won't worry about. But if you can put that picture back up there, tech, then what you can see is you can. And there's a the reason there's two pictures. There's the other one here, the S73. The one that doesn't say scan. 
Okay, I believe this one looks like it's going to come up. There we go. You can see it a bit better. This is actually, I found this on the web. The first one is a scan of the picture that they sent me, the print. Now, this, here's an enhanced one, which is actually available now on the web. But you can see where the, um, the solar disk is basically only appearing at certain wavelengths. And this is why, you know, if you go to, like, the um, NASA sites, you know, like the SOHO, real-time MPEG movies and stuff. Here is where um, these are just basically all, you know, 171 angstroms, 195 angstroms, 284. It only appears at certain wavelengths. And this is what's really curious about it. You know, the thing's not, a, and it's appearing in the absorption band wavelengths. So nonetheless, this is what NASA was sending me. Um, not these beautiful color pictures. You know, we didn't have the internet in those days. You know, you had to like make a phone call and or write a letter and wait for the things to show up. Um, we didn't have the advantage that we have today of being able to stream all this information. So anyway, is um, the gentleman at the Johnson Space Center got quite um, interested in this himself. He, you know, he. He thought this was very curious. You couldn't. So to track it down, he actually tracked down a man that worked for 25 years in the photographic department of NASA and put me in touch with him. And the guy actually called me for a chat. Um, and it was funny. He was a pretty knowledgeable guy because I was living in Northern California at the time. And he's going, where do you live? I go, a oh, little place up in Northern California. He goes, no, name it. I go, Whitethorn. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, you're up by the Usal Road, which is a road along through the Sinkion Wilderness pretty amazing road. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, we used to like go over all the like photographs and look for cool roads to go drive. And that was one of the cool roads. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this guy's pretty clued up. But um, yeah, he started, so he told me that, yeah, he said it was a big puzzle when they first went up that they could hardly see the stars. And um, he said they started de developing specialized diffraction gratings. You know, so basically when Alan Shepard, uh, you know, Virgil Grissom went up, they couldn't see any stars is what he reported to me. So they started developing diffraction gratings. He said they could start seeing higher order stars, but he didn't know where that went. It became compartmentalized. Um, so anyway, I have to double check on things. So I called up Naval Research Labs in Washington, you know, the Solar Research Center there, and started talking to this uh, guy. And I'm saying, yeah, uh, how come you can't see the stars in space? And he's going, who told you that? He said, I said, I said, NASA. He said, oh, that's some boys down at Goddard pulling your leg. I'm going, no, man, this is like public relations down in Johnson Space Center. He's going, well, I don't know why they tell you that. He says, because you can see the stars in space. He said, and um, here's my, um, he put me on to uh, John Bartow, who was his uh, research assistant. And, um, you know, John was basically up on the first Challenger, and, you know, he's, basically payload specialist, so he did ran something called Space Lab 2, so you know, he spacewalked, he was out there, and uh, so I'm talking to him, he's going, yeah, look, he said, the stars in space, he goes, I don't know why NASA would tell you that, he said, the stars in space are brighter on, they're brighter, and they don't twinkle. I'm going, oh, cool, that makes sense, I really appreciate that, thank you. So I called back my contact in NASA, I'm going, hey, look, man, I just talked to an astronaut, and he told me he could see the stars in space, and they go, well, he's he's a scientist and a trained observer, and he accurately reported his experiences. They said, but the information we gave you is correct. <laughs> I think, well, um, okay, maybe they finished these, these secret diffraction gratings and stuff. Maybe they're in all the optics and stuff that go up. And that's what's interesting in that one clip of the... Um, Patrick Moore interview with the astronauts, which anybody can find on YouTube. Just, you know, just type in Patrick Moore asks 11 crew about seeing the stars, and the video will show up. And uh, one of them, I think it was Collins, he goes, oh, maybe we could see it through the optics. You know, it's like, well, they did have some sort of optics and things. Um, but heavens knows what in the world these things were. Um, so anyway... One day I was driving around California and I was listening to radio station KGO out there, talk radio, which I had been on a few times over various borderland topics. 
and they had this guy Andy Frecknoy who at the time and may still be I don't know was the head of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and um, he was always he's always one of these sort of debunkers and space is just dirty uh, comets or dirty snowballs that sort of stuff and um, a know-it-all sort of guy so I thought oh, this would be fun call in it was before a day of cell phone so I pulled over I saw a gas station so I pulled over and slugged a few quarters into the payphone and called KGO and got on and uh, you know within a minute I'm here chatting this guy out going yeah how come you can't see the stars in space <laughs> and he's going no no you can he goes well, where did you get that idea I said from NASA I go no no no, no, no. what so they hung up on me and go no it's got you know we get these calls you know and I'm listening to him he's going oh look I got he was telling the audience that I got pictures of star I got pictures of stars in space hanging on my wall that were gifts from astronauts so I called back to um, NASA on that one and asked my contact I said look I just talked to this head of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and he said he's got pictures on his wall that are photos of stars taken from space by astronauts and the guy's going well I don't know where he got them from he says because there are no pictures from stars in white light taken by astronauts and you know that's why I had the uh, NASA catalogs which I showed earlier um, there are no pictures of stars they had some sort of uh, uh, ultra extreme ultraviolet stellar thing on NASA, but I wasn't able to find actually any of the. I mean, on Skylab, I wasn't able to find any of the photos of that. You think? That, I mean, let's think of it this way: like you're going up in space, and um, what's the first thing you do? Hey, look, <laughs> stars are brighter up here. There's the moon. There's the planets. How many hours of space shuttle footage have you watched or seen? You know, they actually like turn the camera over and go, hey, look over there. There's the moon. There's some stars. Now they're taking pictures of stars from the International Space Station, but they certainly weren't at the time. And let me see if I can put up this picture here. Here's which, which one? Here's the only white light photo I was able to find of the sun from space. And this is a coronagraph. So the sun is blocked out. And here we see the corona, and this is actually, this will be like polished steel or aluminum. So it's a reflection. So this is the only white light photo I was able to find from that period, I, I, as well as other coronagraphs in books, but this was the actual one from Skylab. Um, so here we have reflection. So obviously they're reflecting. Well, one of the other things that was told to me by the, um, let me figure out how to stop sharing this here. This uh, gentleman that worked for the uh, photographic department was then in private practice, so I guess he could talk. He told me, he said, well, this guy, he said it was weird. He said, the guy, it always puzzled him that the astronauts told him that, well, you could see, um, they could see the sun. He said they were ordered not to look at it, you know, because of the intensity of the, uh, optical radiation and potentially other radiation he said but you know they're in these little tin cans with little windows so you can um, obviously could see it but they said yeah they could sort of see it and he said it was weird they could like see the brightness of the sun on the window but it was like they were looking through it and they could see like this darkish more brownish red body behind it as so, though and um, I believe we have this picture here could you put that picture up tech of the um, the one from um, Koresh's book, if we can get that picture up there. Sure. This one? Uh, no, the one that I had you uh, invert so that we could, that, that one will work but doesn't, um, we don't have the detail. That one, if you could yeah, blow that one up a bit. And what we see in there is, um, so this is from you know, Koresh, the cellular cosmogony, where he claims we live on the inside of the Earth. But, but what's interesting about it is he shows a visible light. The sun actually appears in the upper atmosphere. And that's what we're looking at in this diagram here. Um, and I've wondered about that. You know, we looked at, there's various things like, uh, you know, Professor uh, August Picard, um, who's brother John Picard was actually potentially the name um, Star Trek the namesake for uh, John Pic uh, 
Picard from Star Trek. Jean-Luc Picard. So August, Jean-Luc Picard, right. So August Picard um, and his brother John Picard, they actually were working on uh, balloons. So August went up um, uh, back in the 30s. Here it is. Um, here we say this is just a uh, world record for men balloon ascent is presently 22 miles where the air pressure is 1 50th of its value but as a child I was very aware of the record breaking balloon flights being made by John and this is Jeanette but it should be August Picard in 1934 they reached an altitude of 11 miles later Life magazine ran a photo they taken of one of their flights it showed inky black sky above and the arc of Earth's horizon in the distance and I'd come across that reference younger where uh, somebody was quoting Picard claiming that you know, he was surprised when he got up that sp sky turned black. He was actually expecting to see stars and stuff. And you can see that, too, that uh, gentleman um, that jumped out of the um, oh, thing Felix. last year, Felix yeah. Baumgartner. Yeah, so you, de you definitely, I mean, there's a few uh, videos which we can't play here because we have them sort of keyed up. Of There's some guys over in Italy that have been selling GoPro cameras up as high as they can, I think, like... Uh, you know, like 30, you know, 30 kilometers or something like that, 15 miles. Um, space definitely gets black. You don't really see the stars. But I thought um, perhaps it would be good to maybe um, read through what some of the astronauts have said here. So what I will do is um, cue this up and read some of this here. So... Buzz Aldrin, while riding Apollo 11 on its way to the moon, he spoke about the aircraft's induced rotation around its longitudinal axis. The only consolation was the magnificence of the visual spectacle that paraded past their portals during every roll, what Aldrin calls an incredible panorama every two minutes as the sun, moon, and earth appeared in our windows one at a time. There was no mention of stars or planets. His partner, Neil Armstrong, is also quoted, the sky is black, you know, it's a very dark sky. Okay, and then here's on Gemini 10 mission, while spacewalking, Collins noted, My God, the stars are everywhere, above me, on all sides, even below me somewhat, down there next to that obscure horizon. The stars are bright, and they are steady. And then by the time he gets to the Agena, which is a lunar thing, uh, the stars are gone. Three years later, on his way to the moon in Apollo 11, he writes, I can't see the Earth, only the black starless sky behind the Agena. The next page is, I slowly cartwheeled away from the Agena. I see nothing but the black sky for several seconds. Uh, 150 pages later, he also writes, What I see is disappointing, for only the brightest stars are visible through the telescope, and it is difficult to recognize them when they are n not accompanied by the dimmer stars. Uh, that's an incredible statement. Our normal stars seen clearly through a thick atmosphere here on Earth by the naked eye were so dim in space that even a telescope fails to reveal them. All I conclude is that star blindness must be like malaria. You are subject to unpredictable random attacks of star blindness when you're in zero gravity. This is written by um, Ralph Rene, who passed away a few years ago from his book, NASA Moon to America. Um, That's a great geez, book title. It, it is, yeah, yeah. No, so I corresponded with Ralph back in the day. Um, I corresponded okay. with everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, um, I was put in touch with him from... Um, uh, Tom Valentine, who was doing Radio Free America, because he was putting Ralph on as well, so he put us in touch. So nevertheless, as Apollo 11 capsule around the moon, the situation changed. As we, uh, Apollo 11 commander Neil Armstrong, by far the most laconic member of the crew, was also moved to comment, Houston, it's been a real change for us. Now we are able to see the stars again and recognize constellations for the first time on the trip. The sky is filled with stars, just like nights out on Earth. So this is supposedly when they get behind the moon, they can see stars, but they couldn't see them before. When they get behind the moon? Uh, yeah. Okay, so then once they rounded the moon, once again, the situation brings forth this comment from Mike Collins. Outside my window, I can see stars, and that is all. Where I know the moon to be, there is simply a black void. The moon's presence is defined slowly by the absence of stars. So uh, more confusion emerges as we really the following explanatory note by Collins. Toward the sun, nothing can be seen but its blinding disk, whereas down sun, there is simply a black void. The stars are there, but they cannot be seen because with sunlight flooding the spacecraft, the pupil of the eye involuntarily contracts, 
and the light from the stars is too dim to compete with reflected sunlight as both enter the eye through the tiny aperture formed by the contracted pupil. No, to see the stars, the pupil must be allowed to relax, to open wide enough to let the starlight form a visible image on the retina, and that can be done by blocking out the sunlight. Then they rip plates over, rig plates over the windows and he reports, under these conditions, the eye slowly dark adapts itself and the bright, brighter stars gradually emerge from the void. Fourteen years later, Collins wrote another book. This, the writing is so different from his first one that one would almost think it was written by someone else or at least another ghost writer. In it, he proclaims, my God, the stars are everywhere, even below me. They are somewhat brighter than on Earth. Towards the end of that book, he declares, Never a day without sunshine or a night without stars. Fat, unblinking stars. Okay, so, right, they're everywhere. You can't see them, but they're everywhere. That's the same guy reporting that. Um, okay, here's uh, Apollo 14 mission. The astronauts had a hard time seeing the stars, even with the help of a special monocular used to supplement the scanning telescope and the sextant. Due to the absence of an atmosphere to reflect and, refract and filter light, the stars do not twinkle in cislunar space. Rather, as Stu Rusa puts it, the stars look like little points of light or fuzzy little dots. On the same mission, Rusa's crewmate, Ed, this very eerie feeling, you suddenly start to recognize that, yeah, you're in deep space, that the planets are just that, planets. You're not really connected to anything anymore, that you're floating through this deep black void. Oh, what, are the stars everywhere, or is it a deep black void? Uh, that would be nice to know. <clears throat> uh, here we go here. Uh, Stu Russo again, the dim light photography was very complicated because you had to do it in total blackness. The blackest you can ever put a human being in without closing him in an absolute black room. You have no earth light, you have no sunlight, you have no reflected light, bending the corners anywhere. It is black, black. Now, I mean, I've been out in the desert in the wilderness and, um, you know, on new moon, and the yeah, stars are bright. You can actually see the starlight. Um, so if they're brighter on up there, how come it's so black? Uh, Gene Cernan on Apollo 17 talked about star bl blindness. When sunlight comes in through the blackness of space, it's black. I didn't say it's dark. I said black. So black you can't even conceive how black it is in your mind. The sunlight doesn't strike anything. So all you see is black. So um, here is your... Gagarin, first Russian cosmonaut, who says the flight, astonishingly bright cold stars could be seen through the windows. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Um, and I want to show here at the end, let me find, flip down. So what, uh, here we go, Ralph made this uh, lovely little uh, device here. So um, for looking at stars, so you can see here where um, he would look through a star like this, and to you could have the sun coming through, or you know he was doing it with the light to show how it wor would work. But basically, nothing could really stop him from seeing the stars at night, <clears throat> you know, shining light in the different sort of sides. So, kind of pointing out what the astronauts were saying doesn't really work in actual practice if you make a little device. So here's where we go to. So basically, you know, what was reported to me by John Barto ties in with what the um, Soviet astronaut said. So why is there, wh why would NASA tell me you can't see the stars and they had to develop special diffraction gratings? And why get guys like Collins, you know, so, so space is all black, but there's stars everywhere, you know, depends on when he was writing it. Um, so there seems to be a bit of confusion about it. 